welcome to the Political Philosophy Podcast. I'm Toby Buckle. What you're about to listen to is the second part of a two-part series on the real-life, very entertaining and very acrimonious exchange that occurred between Theodore Adorno and Karl Popper in the 60s and early 70s. If you want the context of this conversation, you're more than welcome to go back to the first part, where I trace out the history of the critical theory and some of the background things that I think are going on here. If you don't care too much for context, then please do just jump in here. This is an audience-selected topic, or at least selected from a list of things I felt I had at least the pretense of qualifications to talk about, and not by audience selection, just about by I think it's time. For next week's episode, I'm going to do an audience questions. So tweet at me, reply to this episode, send me an email. I'll get through as many audience questions as I can in the next one. I think it's about time for one of those. I've done a bunch of interviews, I've done some solo stuff, and there's a bunch of big political news happening in general. So if you want my thoughts on any of that, or just something random, just let me know what you'd like me to take on. For this episode, though, we'll be staying with academic history rather than current events or anything else, but it's a bit of academic history I really like. And yes, I'll be genuinely interested to hear what you'll have to say about this. Just quickly, as always, I just saw, just checking my email, that I got a few more people signed up to support the show on Patreon. That's absolutely terrific. Thank you so much. So if you are able to support the show at any level at all, this goes out for free and advertisement free, and all of the costs are covered by listeners. So please do check out the website politicalphilosophypodcast.com or go straight to our Patreon page, patreon.com stroke political philosophy podcast, if you are able to be a part of making it happen. And whether you are or not, Sharing episodes also really helps. It's a very niche product. So if you have friends who would like this, please do share, tag them, anything like that. And yeah, I'm really genuinely grateful for anyone who does any of that. So, without any further preamble, let's get straight to it. This is part two of Popper versus Adorno. What is positivism? Positivism, it's one of these words that keeps coming up in a bunch of different contexts, and everyone seems to think they know exactly what it means, but when you compare the definitions that they give, they're all over the map. So, in response to the last episode, I got a few questions, which are completely fair enough, which are sort of to the effect of, I, that's very different to what I understood positivism to be. I thought it was X, where X is a particular tightly constrained definition that has necessary and sufficient conditions to it. This is, I mean, this is what philosophers do, right? They like to get down to necessary and sufficient conditions of words. So in this episode, I'm just going to take this up. What is positivism? Because I think what this word could mean and is being understood to mean or being misunderstood to mean is really at the heart of this dispute between Adorno and Popper that I've been setting up in um, in the last episode. So here's my first pass at this, is I'm just looking at accounts of positivism within this particular disagreement between critical theorists on the one hand, represented by Adorno, and people who would not call themselves positivists on the other, represented by Karl Popper. And 
I think one thing that I've realised, sort of going back to some of this material and trying to wrap my head around it again, is you're not really going to understand what critical theorists mean by positivism from the outside. There's not I don't think there's going to be a way of explaining what this word is doing for them without understanding the basic categories and concepts through which they're approaching social reality. And I tried to set up some of those categories and concepts in terms of the history of Marxism and the dialectic in the last episode, but I don't... I think if you're just approaching it through the basic paradigm, the categories and concepts of a more sort of empirical, analytical framework, a sort of syllogism, x plus y equals z sort of framework, which Karl Popper is, what they're saying is going to seem like trivialities at best, and at worst, just utter hysterical gibberish. And you can tell that it's between those two poles that uh, that's how how Popper reads them. Um, In my account, I've tried to be broader. I've tried to say positivism is essentially a mirror image. It's, It's a way of explaining how critical theorists think about subjectivity and objectivity by sort of pointing to its opposite. Now, that's not to say that there aren't other definitions of positivism floating around out there, but what this debate has come down to between Popper and Adorno, which, like I said, is two people completely talking past each other and then getting angry at each other for talking past each other, if you could identify a single crux, it's Adorno saying, you're a positivist and here's why that's wrong, and Popper saying, dude, I'm not a positivist. I've I've disavowed that label many times, and what you're describing to me doesn't seem to particularly resemble my views. And Adorno doubling down and going, no, no, there is an important sense in which you are a positivist. And so when you're in that situation, I think the natural move for someone trying to write a commentary on this debate is to go and try and find a definition of positivism, and then say, okay, what are the arguments for or against this? So this is what the English translate, the the introduction to the English translation does. So von Wright, summing up the debate, for instance, he says, here's the definition of positivism. It has three components. Number one, methodological monism, meaning the unity of the scientific method. Number two, mathematical sciences as a set of methodological ideals for all sciences. And number three, causal scientific explanation. So, quote, the subsumption of individual cases under hypothetically assumed general laws, end quote. So what that means is, just as you can, in, in the natural sciences, you can sum up a bunch of data and conclude a law from it. So something like the law of universal gravitation, which is a sort of ontologically real thing we imagine that exists in all circumstances and is universally valid. Likewise, we can look at the social sciences and say, you know, we sum all up all this data and realise there's this law of um, supply and demand or historical materialism in the case of Marx, and that knowledge can, knowledge is essentially the, the search for and the finding and the demonstration of those um, quote-unquote general laws, end quote. So that's von Wright's approach. He says these three things... Um, methodological monism, uh, mathematical sciences as a methodological ideal, and causal scientific explanation. Those are, you know, taken together, that's positivism. And a whole load of other people have given completely different definitions. Some people have said that it's to do with falsifiability. Some people have said it's to do with the nature of analytic reasoning, and so on and so forth. And in some cases, there are positivists who meet those particular definitions. Um, But in the context of this debate, I'm exploring 
there simply isn't. So take von Wright's definition, which I gave you. This is, um, I mean, it's weird, right? Like, you've got this professional studying this and getting to write the book on it, but it's clearly inadequate. So the third principle, that of um, causal scientific explanation, so in other words, these sort of general laws of society, this is one that Popper explicitly argues against, or at least insofar as applicable to the social sciences. And there's many other counterexamples we could give to this particular definition. And indeed, this is my point. Any general definition will suffer from being either too vague to be meaningful or too specific to encapsulate the actual uses of the term even just within the debate that we're looking at. And then beyond that, you have to provide an account for why it's so important for the critical theorists represented by Adorno to spend so much time attacking not just a label, but specific views that Popper specifically disavows. So um, David Frisby, in another uh, introduction to an English translation, of this debate, says the problem, quote, seems to suggest the unsatisfactory nature of any historical definition of positivism, end quote. And he seems to think that that's just a sort of insoluble problem. But remember where I'm coming from, and, you know, you always get the Toby take on these debates, right? And you all know what the Toby take is at this point. The Toby take is a ordinary common sense, ordinary language, Wittgensteinian, essential contestability sort of take, where I just say, let's let's calm down with the philosophy and say, never mind what you think these words ought to mean. Just how are they being used? What do they actually mean? What are the common recurring themes and patterns, to use a Wittgensteinian term? What are the family resemblances? Which just means, what are the features that these words tend to, but don't always have, as they are actually being used? Right? And so that's how I'm going to approach this, as sort of the essential contestability theorist that I am, which is to just bring in another methodological framework into this dispute about methodological frameworks. But let's just look at what's actually going on in terms of how the language is being used. So I'm not going to give you a universal definition um, at least in so far as anything that would reduce to particular principles or necessary and sufficient conditions like uh, uh, von Wright is attempting to do. Um, instead, I'm just going to look at the recurring themes, and I'll be following a basic schema I got from a paper by Gruber and Lincoln. It's 1994, Gruber and Lincoln, um, which essentially asks... How do you compare and contrast different total worldviews? So something like Marxism isn't just one set of claims about economics. It's a total worldview that provides you an account of, yes, economics, yes, politics, but also science, also epistemology, everything. It is a total way of looking at the world. And as are some forms of liberalism as well, by the way. So... How do you compare different total worldviews? And they say, and I think this is really, really useful, take a step back and try and compare and contrast them as different claims about ontology, epistemology, and methodology. And I think this is a logically, I, I really like this, actually. I think this is a logically clear way to approach the question. And if you take something from this, it might just be that, in that you might walk away thinking, well, what do I care about this particular weird historical debate? And hey, I wouldn't blame you. But sometimes when you get these debates, where people do just seem to be unable to find terms even to agree on, and it seems like there's no level of sort of common dialogue to just take a step back and say, what are they saying? ontologically, what are they saying epistemologically, and what are they saying methodologically. And what you won't get there is agreement, 
It might well be that no agreement is possible, but you'll at least have provided a map of the terrain. I I also think it's just like a logically clear order to approach it in, as in what we consider reality to be, that's ontology. An ontological statement is just a statement about what we consider is really real, and whatever that turns out to mean, right? That will condition what we believe we can know about it, and that's epistemology. What what is epistemology is theory of knowledge, essentially. So what is real will condition what we can know about what is real. Right? And the nature of knowledge, epistemology, will in turn condition how we are going to set about collecting knowledge and our general approach to research and the sort of steps we'll employ in that which is methodology, right? So I I almost in my head think about it as like a pyramid coming out from ontology down through epistemology and down finally to the base of methodology, or alternately working up from a base of various methodologies two statements about epistemology to finally a claim or a set of claims about what is really real. And so they're clearly like three levels of like an interdependent thing, right? I can just hear some like real philosophers of science screaming here, but that's how I think about it. And I think that is like at least in the social sciences, I'm not going to touch like philosophy of science here, like God help me. But in the social sciences, when you're dealing with like fundamentally contrasting worldviews, that little three levels, ontology, epistemology, methodology, I like that. that. That's just like a nice, that clicks for me and hope it does for you too. So getting, let, let, let's start applying this to critical theory. And I think let, in terms of trying to get these recurring themes of what positivism is about, this will be a really nice schema. So my own assessment of the claims critical theory makes about positivism is it says some interesting stuff, particularly on the bottom layer, methodology, but the theory it's attempting to defend in contrast to positivism is epistemologically and ontologically equally unable to meet the attacks that it levels against positivism. Um... This is no more than my personal reaction to this, and I'm going to explain exactly why I think that, but it's it's worth emphasising, as Adorno does, that this is not a debate in which the rival parties can even agree to terms. And further, as um, Gruber and Lincoln, who I've been using here, state, quote, paradigms as sets of be- basic beliefs are not open to proof in any conventional sense. There is no way to elevate one over the other on the basis of any ultimate foundational criteria, end quote. Because think about it, what would the ultimate foundational criteria, as they put it, be? Well, presumably, it would be a set of claims about epistemology or ontology, right? But that's what's in dispute here. So how do you settle that? Can you settle that? <laughs> All right. Um, we ready for our first little break? Was that was that has that got too heavy? Let's take a short break, shall we? Elevator music, you know, do 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 do. Okay, I can't sing. Let's get straight back in. So, let's at least begin by trying to map out the terrain, and let's start at the top of the pyramid, which is ontology. What is really real here? So, to begin with, at the most fundamental level, the basic account critical theory gives of positivist ontology is that of naive realism. So in other words, reality, including social reality, is both real and can be apprehended. So remember to the critical theorist, there's sort of two ways of doing this. There's their way and the positivist way, which is the opposite. So the opposite of their way is naive realism, a view of the world in which positivists are assumed to think. We can objectively know the facts about social, economic, 
political worlds, and even deduce quote-unquote laws comparable to those of the natural sciences. Now, this is an accurate description of early positivists. So August Comte, who um, he actually coined the term positivism along with the term sociology, he was fascinated by advances in the natural sciences, and he believed he had successfully applied those advances in the natural sciences to the social, and had discovered in the process the fundamental, and I'm just using his words, quote, laws of history, end quote. An even more extreme example, and this is one of my favourite thinkers, who nobody ever reads these days, is Saint-Simon. Um, and even though he, he was a bizarre thinker in a lot of ways, and his application of scientific principles to social events was eccentric, shall we say, he was nonetheless convinced that he had discovered these inexorable laws of historical process. Of historical progress. Um, so we don't really talk about those thinkers much anymore. But, and significantly to the, this debate, these ontological understandings were picked up and used by Marx and subsequent Marxists. Like, Saint Simon sounds bonkers today, so does Comte, but that discourse does feed into orthodox Marxism. And I think if you're looking at, like, what did the historical Marx actually mean, there's some pretty woo-woo stuff in there. Let's, let's be honest. I'm not, I am not someone, actually, as left-leaning critiques of Marxists go, who, criticize, who dismisses all Marxism as bogus. I think there are things of value to be salvaged there. But I think also, if you're going to pretend there's not some pretty out there stuff that if you just state it in the simplest terms is bonkers, then you're also kind of kidding yourself. So that's, that's that bit. And Von Wright said a similar thing, right, about like, like the subsumption into general laws. But here's what I want to point out and re relevant to this debate is it's not just Marxists. If I say laws of economics and society, what's the first place as a modern person that your mind goes? It goes to economics. It goes to libertarians, right? And critical theorists are going to be equally keen to criticise them as well. And here's what I actually feel a little bit conflicted between those two sides, in that... I was having a conversation quite some time ago now with a friend of mine who's an economist. I think they were in training to be an economist at the time, but they, they are actually an economist with the World Bank now. And we were sort of talking about a lot of the things I bring up about, like essential contestability and the sort of permeability of many of the foundational concepts of economics, which I see as being ideological. And he sort of said, look... You philosophers and historians and whatever, you're so critic. You're so concerned to show the the potential failings and misunderstandings of the core assumptions of economics that you just can't get past that to see that if you just grant them just as modelling assumptions, just grant them as modelling assumptions, you can get some really interesting and often really counter-expectational stuff out of it that is a really good way of forming a narrative of, of the social world. And um, a lot of economists approach it as this. So Robert Solo, who came up with one of the big models for growth theory in economics, says, and I quote him here, and I love this quote, he says, what you have to understand is that economics is a parable. You do not ask of a parable if it is literally true. You ask if it is well told, end quote. And so I do appreciate that, and I am not without sympathy for that defense of economics. And if I were to come in as Adorno comes in and just respond to that with, yeah, but you're a positivist who believes in these general laws, eventually the economist would get frustrated with me and say, look, I'm not saying when we talk about the laws of supply and demand that these are anything like the laws of universal gravitation. They're a story, they're a metaphor, they're a way of making sense of the world. And if you'll just grant me 
that, yeah, it's not literally true, but it's still a useful framework, there's a whole load of knowledge you could have by looking at the world through this framework that you're not getting. Well, surely that's a fair response from the economist. Or even from the libertarian, right? Well, and here's my uneasiness with it, and I think here's critical theory's uneasiness with it. You, individual economist, may have that more subtle, more nuanced understanding. But the work these ideas are doing in the world, people talk about economic laws as if they really are epistemologically and ontologically equivalent to the laws of natural science. Margaret Thatcher famously said, our basic fight is a fight against the illusion that basic economic laws can be suspended, end quote. Now, it's very clear that what she's talking about is a lot ontologically harder than, than a modelling device. Like, I think a lot of economists would say that our, what we mean by laws doesn't get into ontology. We're not talking about these as if they're real things that are really there in the same way that the, the, the fundamental constants are really there. But when they appear in... in, in political debate, it does appear at least strongly implicitly that people are talking about these things as if they are ontologically real. And so I think that's where the motivation of the critical theorists to not back down comes from. But it's difficult and it's complicated, right? So anyway, let's get back to our description. It, that's what on the ontological level, critical theory sees of positivism, naive realism. Society can be described in the same way as the natural world can be described. What's more, there are laws of society that operate in the same way as there are laws of the natural world. So, what does critical theory have to say about this? You'll remember, like I said, that positivism is sort of a mirror image. It's sort of everything that we're not. So what's it doing here? It's actually here less to attack other people, I think, than to shed light on, on what critical theory thinks about ontology. So critical theory's criticism of positivist ontology, or what it imagines positivist ontology is, is that it misunderstands the subject because it does not understand his relationship to the social whole or totality. This word totality is going to keep coming back. For now, just read social whole into that. Indeed, one of the most frequent attacks made on positivism is simply that it denies the existence of this totality, which means that it will never comprehend reality, but instead will mask it. So uh, the, the thing with the totality is, um, so what is this? Um, the, the totality is a dialectical category employed by Hegel and Marx, which undergoes a shift in meaning in critical theory. So in Hegel and Marx, the individual subject is subsumed within it. In critical theory, um, as Adorno puts it, they're in a reciprocal relationship that can only be apprehended in its reciprocity, end quote. So, what does that mean? So, the mistake that positives, positivists make is to assume that the observer can ever fully detach himself from this totality, which is ontologically real, and that the subject and object can either be separated or reduced to each other. So, you remember I said the basic insight I think critical theory thinks it's, it's had is that the relationship between subject and object is a dialectical one, according to the sort of account of the dialectic that I gave earlier. So here's a quote from Adorno. The, the relationship between subjectivity and objectivity is, quote, neither an ultimate duality nor a screen hiding an ultimate unity, end quote. Neither an ultimate duality, nor a screen hiding an ultimate unity. So, end quote. So that's a, a very dialectical way of understanding 
the relationship between those two objects. Now, to make it even more complicated, this ontological criticism of positivism takes different forms within critical theory. So Horkheimer, and if there's a critical theorist I actually quite like, it's Horkheimer. I must admit I don't like Adorno very much, but Horkheimer stresses that the imagined, imagined separation between the social scientist on the one hand and his or her cultural, historical, and ideological surroundings will mean that he or she will, in will invariably reproduce them. Pure objectivity, in the sense of being completely detached from a subject matter, is impossible, as our identities and thoughts are all shaped by this social totality. Adorno takes this understanding further. So, according to, Ad according to Adorno, not only are the positivists' beliefs what they are because of a particular development of ideology, he, by the way, ascribes to positivists an ideology called scientism. Scientism, I will just say, is another one of these things that, although there are people who put their hands up and say, I'm a positivist, I don't know there's anyone who'll say I'm a scientivist. This is just a word they made up to smear people, honestly. But, okay, Adorno says, not only are the positivists' beliefs what they are because of particular development of ideology, scientism, but because the social totality is, in itself, contradictory and oppressive, the effect of positivist scientism will be to throw a curtain over this and to mask the oppressive nature of social relations. And if that didn't necessarily go down the gullet smoothly, I, I'm honestly not sure that this is worth understanding at this point. Look, Adorno carries the argument much too far. So he says not only does scientism mask the oppressive reality of the totality, but because of the principle of non-contradiction, it cannot itself understand the contradictions embedded in the social totality. Um, okay, this is this is just a point, surely. I think Ador uh, I think sorry, Popper is much too quick to pull. Imagine in this debate we've got a little lever that's like, just say it in bloody plain English, man. Um I think Popper goes for that lever like that, but I think that doesn't mean that that's not a lever that we would want to pull at some point. So let's just really, we, because of the principle of non-contradiction, we cannot understand the contradictions embedded within social reality. <sighs> look, look let, let's just try and like break this down in plain English, right? Look. The notion that reality itself is contradictory, yeah, you could put that as a clear ontological dichotomy between critical theory and its account of positivism. So positivism imagines that reality, including social reality, is one thing, and critical theory imagines it's contradictory. You could say that, right? That could be one way you could divide up the space, and that seems to be how Adorno wants to do it. But I don't... I, come on. Um, look, let's just get back down to it. There's, there's nothing about the principle of non-contradiction that prevents us from recognising that different social groups believe different things, and that a particular person may hold contradictory beliefs. Um, so Adorno wants to say, I'm trying to get this into the simplest terms possible, Adorno wants to say that positivists are committed to unifying all knowledge, therefore they're not capable of comprehending that um, society is not unified. Um, th there might be some fundamental level I'm missing to this, but I can be as positivisty as I want. I can say, you know, I'm using methodological tools from the natural sciences to study social sciences, but it's quite clear that actual human society is very contradictory, that different people believe different things, and indeed the same person believes different things. So I sort of don't get 
what Adorno is saying there. And I don't know. And like, it's just the point at which his language is so dense and abstract that I'm not even sure how I'm supposed to be assessing what he's saying there. I think there's something to this idea that, you know, you've got to understand yourself as part of a social whole. Sure, I can see that. But when you get into this sort of the social whole is contradictory stuff, are you just saying that the justifications for society don't conform to a unified whole, which I don't think they do? But if that's all you're saying, then there's nothing that even the most hardcore positivist can't accept there. If you're saying something more fundamental than that, then what are you saying? So let's take a step back. Let's de-escalate at this point. And let's look at sort of what the other side's saying. So that's what positivism Sorry, that's what critical theory says about positivism ontologically and how it responds to it, which, like I say, takes different forms. Um, I mean, I think the first thing to say is this account is not appropriate to all positivists. So we should consider what may be termed, a Gruber and Lincoln term this post-positivism, or how Popper self-described as critical rationalism. So this posits a real reality that is epistemologically never fully knowable. So yes, reality is real. Yes, there is a, you know, like a real ontology in some meaningful sense. But there's always going to be a bit of a gap because of, you know, these concerns about subjectivity that critical theorists are raising. There's always going to be a bit of a gap between reality and what we can know about it. Now, this is a distinct ontological position which critical theorists never engage directly with in any meaningful way whatsoever. Uh, so Adorno notes that Popper dismisses a direct application of the understandings of natural science onto social science, but then utterly fails to engage with Popper's actual position, and Darendorf notes this in his reply. Popper, due to this lack of engagement, concludes that, quote, my opponents literally did not know how to criticise me rationally, quote, and then hence, quote, all they could do was label me a positivist, end quote. And you know what? We're actually going to dig in and do a bit of Popper in his own words, because I've been sort of trying to, like, make sense of wh where critical theory's coming from, but let's give Popper a bit of weight at the table here. How's he responding to all of this, right? Well, what he's going to want to say about objectivity is essentially, yeah, I do want to be as objective as possible, but I just mean something different by it. For me, objectivity isn't about a complete congruence between epistemology and ontology. It's, well, you know what? Why don't I read you him on, in his own words? Because I can with Popper. This is from Reason and Revolution. Quote, as against this, I stressed that the objectivity of natural and social science is not based on an impartial state of mind in the scientists, but merely on the fact that the public and competitive character of the scientific enterprise, and thus on certain social aspects of it. This is why I wrote, quote, what the so-called sociology of knowledge overlooks is just the sociology of knowledge the social or public character of science, end quote. Continuing on from that within the same quote, objectivity is based, in brief, upon mutual rational criticism, upon the critical approach, upon the critical tradition. Thus, natural scientists are not more objectively minded than social scientists, nor are they more critical if there is more objectivity in the natural sciences, then it is because there is a better tradition and higher standards of clarity and of rational criticism. In Germany, many of the social scientists were brought up as Hegelians, and this is, in my opinion, a tradition destructive of intelligence and of critical thought. 
It is one of the points where I agree with Karl Marx, who wrote, quoting from Marx, in this mystifying form, dialectic became accepted into the German fashion, end quote. It is the German fashion still. End quote to all of that. So that's Popper's basic response to the point about objectivity. Um, what about this idea that he denies the reality of the, the, the social totality, right? So that, that this thing, this quite mystical dialectical form, this sort of social whole that, that we've been talking about. Well, he essentially views it as a triviality. Let, let's be real here and let's ask the question in common sense terms. We've done the dialectic, we've done the history, but come on, in common sense terms, what do they mean by totality? Do they just mean that society forms a whole that can't be, it can't be merely understood just as separate people? Is that all they're saying? In which case, why this really in-depth and intricate, and let's be real, incomprehensible system so I'm just going to read you Popper at length because he'll he'll put the critique better than I will, and it's this is just this is just really funny, and this is sort of why I do like this debate, and I've tried to be fair to Adorno by not giving you Adorno in his own words by doing my best to make sense of it. I think the strongest I can give you with Popper is to just give you him in his own words. So let's have a little read. This is a little bit further on from the same essay, Reason and Revolution. So, quote, I now come to my main point. It is this. Some of the famous leaders of German sociology who do their intellectual best and do it with the best conscience in the world are nevertheless, I believe, simply talking trivialities in high-sounding language. As they were taught, they teach this to their students who are dissatisfied, yet do the same. In fact, the genuine and general feeling of dissatisfaction which is manifest in their hostility to the society in which they live is, I think, a reflection of their unconscious dissatisfaction with the sterility of their own activities. I will give a brief example from the writings of Professor Adorno. The example is a select one, indeed selected by Professor Habermas, who begins his first contribution to the positivist by quoting it. End quote. And what follows is the best and by far and away the funniest table and i really wanted to share this with you guys that um i've ever seen you remember i said this debate makes me laugh out loud at some points this bit <laughs> this bit definitely does the best table i have ever seen in any academic paper ever <laughs> so he sets up this table returning to the text quote on the left I give the original German text. In the centre, the text as translated in the present German volume, and on the right, a paraphrase into simple English of what seems to have been asserted." End quote. So in other words, and I told you at some points in this, Popper is just simply going to mock Adorno. And I have to say, given the way in which Adorno communicates, I think it is wholly appropriate that he gets taken down a notch. So I might just share the image of this um, table, just so you can get a sense of it. But I was thinking, I was thinking, how can I get this in like audio form? So here's what you're visualising. He's got a table where he's got a quite a long, and it's Adorno, so very, very dense quote from Adorno. And he's broken it up into sections, and each section is a row. So a horizontal section of the table. And in each row, he's got three columns, three parts. He's got the original German, which I wanted to bring you here, but it's just of how intimidating it sounds. The literal English translation. And then, as Popper says, a translation of the English translation 
into simple language, as he puts it, of what seems to have been asserted here. So Popper's whole point is, can we, we'll translate it from the German, and then once we get the direct translation, can we translate that into, like, what has actually been said? Dude, like, what are you actually saying? So I'm going to do the whole table for you, just to give you an idea of this, and the way we're going to do it is I wasn't able to do the German sections, I don't know the language well enough, but I put out a call online and I said, do any of the listeners of the show speak German? And I got a few volunteers. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a German speaker read you the German bits. I'll do in my nasally voice, that I do as a dismissive one, the uh, translation into English of what Adorno's saying. And then I'll just tell you in my regular voice what Popper has said he thinks has actually been asserted here. So this is a very elaborate way that Popper has gone into to mock Adorno for being overwordy. And I asked my German-speaking volunteer, Florian, if he sounded as pompous and over-the-top in German as he did in the direct English translation, and he said no, even more so. So keep that in mind. So let's do the whole table, and just ask yourself, is Popper right to mock Adorno in the way he does? So let's set this up. Here are the three voices that you'll hear. Hello, I'm Florian Riederer, and I'll be reading the German sections. Hi, this is Toby in my nasally dismissive voice, and I'll be doing the English literal translation of Adorno's German. Hi, this is Toby in his normal voice, and I'll be doing the translation of what Popper believes Adorno has asserted, translated into plain English. So we get the idea? And the reason I thought this would be fun to do, beyond it just being really fun, is this is the bit that Popper has chose to mock Adorno for, where he actually explains what he means by social totality. So, let's get started. Die gesellschaftliche Totalität führt kein Eigenleben oberhalb des von ihr zusammengefassten, aus dem sie selbst besteht. Societal totality does not lead a life of its own over and above that which unites, and of which in turn it is composed. Translation. Society consists of social relationships. Sie produziert und reproduziert sich durch ihre einzelnen Momente hindurch. It produces and reproduces itself through its individual moments. Translation. The various social relationships somehow produce society. So wenig aber jenes Ganze vom Leben, von der Kooperation und dem Antagonismus seiner Elemente abzusondern ist. This totality can no more be detached from life, from the cooperation and the antagonism of its elements. Translation. Among these relationships, our cooperation and antagonism. And since, as we've just mentioned, society consists of relationships, we can't separate it from them. So wenig kann irgendein Element auch bloß in seinem Funktionieren verstanden werden, ohne Einsicht in das Ganze, das an der Bewegung des Einzelnen selbst sein Wesen hat. Then can an element be understood merely as it functions without, insight into the whole, which has its source, its vine, its essence, in the motion of the individual entity itself. Translation. The opposite is also true. The relationships can't be understood without society. System und Einzelheit sind reziprok und nur in ihrer Reziprozität zu erkennen. System and individual entity are reciprocal and can only be apprehended in their reciprocity. Translation, repetition of the preceding thought. 
<laughs> so, um, that's his translation of Adorno. And he goes on to present this comment. He says, quote, Comment. The theory of social holes developed here has been presented and developed, sometimes better and sometimes worse, by countless philosophers and sociologists. I do not assert that it is mistaken. I only assert the complete triviality of its content. Of course, Adorno's presentation is very far from trivial. It is for reasons such as these that I find it difficult to discuss any serious problem with Professor Habermas. I'm sure he's perfectly sincere, but I think that he does not know how to put things simply, clearly and modestly, rather than impressively. Most of what he says seems to me trivial. The rest seems mistaken. End quote. So, that's Popper's read of all of this. So, should we take a breather and review the ground that we've covered thus far? So, critical theory, which is a response to a particular crisis in Marxism describing the subjective and the objective, has said that we're different from positivists, which is this huge blanket category, including proto-Marxists, Marxists, and modern economists, we're different from positivists because the positivist doesn't recognise, on an ontological level, the reality of the social totality. The critical theorists do. They recognise that the social totality is a real thing, and we have to get that down before we can proceed to epistemology and methodology. Against that, Popper has shot back that the, the critical theorists, all they're managing to do when describe the social totality is to assert in his translation, that society consists of social relationships. And he says, I'm not in opposition to that necessarily. I'm simply sceptical of how useful it is. Again, to quote the bit I just gave you, I do not assert that it is mistaken. I only assert the complete triviality of its content, end quote. And um, there's a similar defence in the same volume by Hans Albert, against Habermas's attack on positivism, where he says, given that critical theorists, quote, look upon this concept as fundamental, it is all the more regrettable that they do not provide a precise clarification, end quote. So this is surely fair, right? If the concept of totality is going to do this big a role in your thinking, you need to define it better, and in a way that your opponents can understand. Um, what, what's more, if the basic ontological criticism is that we can never get ourselves out of social reality, that's fine as like a claim, but it's not clear to me how bringing in this dialectical concept of totality makes the account more convincing. If the concept of, and if it is going to be used to fundamentally distinguish between paradigms, it has to be more clearly explained. All right, so that's ontology. Let's move a layer down the pyramid into epistemology. So, like I said, the epistemology will be influenced by the ontology. So, the ontological notion of the subject as irrevocably part of the objective social totality leads to an epistemological view as the subject's knowledge is a form of value-mediated subjective self-knowledge. In contrast, remember, positivism is sort of just a mirror image. Positivists are assumed to imagine that pure objectivity is possible. So the, the positivist denies this dialectic, this dialectic relationship between subject and object, and they're assumed to consider that a hard separation between subject and object is possible. In other words, that the positivist will separate him or herself from the object reali objective reality of the world, 
and as such he or she falsely assumes that they can obtain knowledge in such a way that their subjective place in the world has no effect on how they receive and interpret that knowledge. Um, so I think this actually may be an appropriate criticism of early orthodox Marxists who thought they had access to, quote, objective reality. So for early Marxists, objective reality consists in the economic structure of relations, the material which determined class oppression and so on. Um, and, and that's obviously false, right? That the very terms they're using to describe, quote unquote, what's objective, so class, economic, oppression, and so on, these are essentially contestable and the result of a subjective interpretation, right? I think, again, what's going on here is it's not so much that the critical theorists really want to attack a well-defined position. It's more like a, it's not X, but Y. It's not your idea of objectivity. You've really got to understand this uh, interconnected, dialectically interconnected nature of the subject and the object. Because, as we've seen, what they're describing as an attack on positivism just doesn't... Well, look, it just doesn't match what Popper is, right? So, as opposed to, like, these orthodox Marxists, the modern uh, targets of the, the, this respond much more convincingly. So Popper, as we've seen, can counter the, the objectivity of a social scientist. He's not a personal matter. It's not a case of them detaching themselves from their own subjectivity, which is impossible. Rather, it's a matter of them being engaged in critical debate, of, of on an epistemological level, putting forward falsifiable hypotheses for rational criticism. In this way, we cannot objectively know the real world as critical theories account of positivism would have it, but we can approximate it. Epistemology is, is, is the, the endless quest of getting better and better theses, theses, I've been getting that one wrong the whole time, about an objective reality that's partially opaque. Which sounds reasonable right like look we're not saying scientists don't have biases we're saying that we can devise structures that partially and i say partially work to counteract those biases such that what gets through those structures what survives critical process and attempts at falsification and peer review you know, we, we have more confidence, not total confidence, not absolute confidence, but more confidence that the stuff that gets through that process coheres roughly to an objective ontology than we do the stuff that doesn't. It's a matter of better and worse approximations. Now, doesn't that just sound like the most reasonable thing in the world? So what do critical theorists say in response to this? And again, I'm trying to give you a fair read of critical theory here, but I think we, we have to admit at some points it begins to like fray and break down here, but let, let me give it a go. So against this, um, Habermas contended that knowledge is not to be found in the mechanical application of rules onto reality, rather with the dialectical engagement with reality itself. Adorno takes this even further, because of course he fucking does. Adorno says, the application of a set of methodological rules onto reality will never give us knowledge. The positivist, according to Adorno, ex insists on the logical coherence of the set of rules they advocate in order to search for the approximate knowledge they seek. However, this is mistaken because reality itself is incoherent. Now, I've already said that, look, there's just problems, and as far as I can see, obvious problems with Adorno's account of the principle of non-contradiction. Um, 
But look, just does, does this hold up a, a, a more fundamental level? Are we throwing the baby out with the bathwater if we aim to destroy what Adorno called the infernal engine of logic? And yes, that's a direct quote, by the way. The infernal engine of logic. That's from Adorno's introduction to the positivist dispute in German sociology. Because, look, here's the thing. In abandoning any attempt to make logical sense of society, well, I mean, one, does that really sound like something we want to be doing? But two, um, I don't think that necessarily leads where critical theory think it, it leads. Um... And I think the fear is that this logical way of looking at society leads to a sort of oppressive status quo. Um, but it also, log trying to make logical sense of society also gives us some of our strongest reasons for doubting that there are these social laws or universal laws of history, which both the critical theorists and Popper are keen to stress that there's not. So in other words, are there absolute laws of society or of history that operate in the same way that natural laws do? Well, here's an argument. So this is from Popper in The Poverty of Historicism, provides us with what I think is the single best argument against any of these sort of laws of historical development or like end of history laws. It's got two premises. Premise number one, the future development of society and politics is strongly influenced by the future development of technology and science. Okay, premise one. Premise two, it is impossible to predict the future growth of knowledge. Okay? Two premises. Conclusion one. If it's impossible to predict the future growth of knowledge, it's impossible to predict the future growth of scientific, science and technology. Conclusion two. Therefore, it is impossible to fully predict the future development of society and politics. Therefore, conclusion three, all end of history prophecies and historical laws are inherently misconceived. And I won't go back and belabor that. Just, you know, rewind the tape or whatever to get that argument. But that's an incredibly powerful argument. The first premise is is obvious. It's obviously true that the development of society is influenced by scientific and technological advances. The second premise, that we can't predict the future growth of knowledge, seems intuitive, but it can actually be logically demonstrated. And once you accept those premises, it's really difficult to resist conclusions three and four. Well, that is as long as you accept the premises of analytical, logical reasoning to carry you from premise to conclusion. And so if we reject, here's my punchline, if we reject all logical forms as non-applicable in sociology, must we then also abandon this understanding? Now, Adorno wants to claim the opposite. He wants to claim that once we accept the principles of positivist scientism, scientism, his word, we, ine we inevitably, that will lead us to accept and defend an oppressive capitalist status quo. Now, I just really deny that that is the case, but you can sort of see why he thinks it, because with Popper, let's be fair, it kind of is. Popper was a supporter of incremental reforms, fair enough, and a strong believer in Hayek's free market principles. I think Adorno, like I said, I think he's wrong to think that one followed from the other, but they were both together in the form of Popper. And here's, here is what's annoying, and I think what is a legitimate criticism of Popper is the arguments he gives against highly predictive theories and highly universal, well, theories that have highly universalizing laws to society. Those criticisms apply just as strongly to free market doctrine as they do to the laws of historical development in Marxism. 
Hayek, look, let's be clear on this, right? Hayek pronounced general laws derived from subjective understandings of human nature, i.e. as rational, egotistical, wealth-maximizing, and so on, and made strong historical predictions based on them. Hayek wants to say, no, I'm sort of setting out the limits of knowledge, but Hayek gives us very strong positive, one might even say positivist, claims to knowledge, i.e. that government interference will invariably lead to oppression and poverty. And these historical predictions ultimately went unfulfilled just as much as those of any Marxist did. Free market doctrine rests on claims of economic theory being a science capable of discovering laws. Like I say, there's many economists who have a much more subtle understanding of it, but as Hayek gave it to us, and as it exists in contemporary libertarian debate, it posits something ontologically real in a way that is misguided, both for the reasons critical theorists give, but also, and let's be fair, it's misguided for the reasons that Popper gave against historicism. And here's what really bugs me, is Marxism has had these moments of, of, of reconciliation with its own failings, and God help me, there were intellectual dead ends. I'm not sure we can really say anything productive has come out of this debate, but it recognised the failure of the historical laws of history that, that came to us through Marx, and it grappled with it, and it wrestled with it, and it tried to say, what about this can be saved and what has to be abandoned, which is the dialectical move, right, the preservation and the abandonment, libertarian free market doctrine has never had to do that. It's never felt the need to do that. You know, as we were ready to build welfare states in the UK, look at my final arm um, part of my libertarianism series, you know, Hayek was saying, Churchill was saying, this cannot be done without a Gestapo. Everything will go to hell if you nationalise healthcare and so on. And we nationalised it and it was fine. Things got better. Bit of a rocky road, you know, but that was to do with dismantling the empire. But we built welfare states when libertarians told us that such a thing was impossible without poverty and oppression. And they, I mean, they have their problems, but they worked out just fine. Libertarianism has never had to reconcile itself with and wrestle with its own empirical falsification in the same way that Marxism has. And there's some sort of great cosmic injustice there, I think, right? It's not to defend Marxism, actually, per se. I've been very hard on the critical theorists throughout this. But I would like to see far more that subjects some of the more preposterous claims of libertarianism, some of its more goopy moments where it, like critical theory, descends into wonkery and jargon, I'd like to see them subjected to the same sort of common sense, ordinary language, scorn and ridicule that Popper, and I think sometimes correctly, heaps on the critical theorists. So let's draw towards the end. What does this mean? We've reviewed ontology, the difference that they want to see between maintaining the existence of this social totality and denying it, and we've reviewed epistemology, the idea of your knowledge being in a reciprocal dialectic interaction with this totality, as opposed to falsely believing, as the positivist has imagined, that a sort of hardline separation between the subject and the object is possible. So let's try to reason through with the critical theorists from their epistemology to their methodology. So, critical theorists say that positivist, again, remembering this is kind of a straw man umbrella term, but critical theorists say that positivist epistemology is incoherent because its knowledge consists in the imposition of an abstract set of principles onto reality and not an understanding of reality itself. That's what Habermas argues in this volume. I mean, first of all, if we're being critical, we can say, in, in, in that case, though, in what sense does a dialectical 
approach to reality offer an improvement? Would this not merely then be the imposition of a different set of categories, you know, dialectical categories rather than logical categories onto reality? There's a number of different responses to this, and some are more plausible than others. So I'll just quickly review a few just to give you a sense of it. So in general, the dialectical approach views knowledge as the product of the collision of thesis and antithesis producing synthesis. Um, And that can be interpreted a number of different ways. I gave you in the first part the way I have made sense of the dialectic, but it's a two-step process where a thing produces its opposite and then in the second step has to be reconciled with it. So older dialectical theorists would have contended that knowledge of reality was ultimately the self-knowledge of a subject-object. So Lucas, for instance, proclaimed that knowledge was possible from, and only from, the standpoint of the proletariat, because it was both the subject and the object of history. Um, And there's a number of good critiques of that. So Marshall Brennan called this notion that all history and all reality should revolve around a particular class, subjectively defined as, quote, cosmic chutzpah, end quote. Critical theory moved away from that, it abandoned these absolute dialectical accounts of knowledge in favour of an epistemology that stressed that knowledge was always partial and always incomplete. Adorno's account, because it always is, was the most radical. According, According to Adorno, critical theory must always be critical of the social categories and contrast itself with the narrative of history generally. If Again, according to Adorno, triumphal liberal scientism tells a story of history as progress, then critical theory must tell the opposite story, one of history as increasing oppression. First, Adorno says, men dominate nature. Then they start to dominate each other. Finally, the domination becomes internal. It becomes a control over people's minds and how they think, as Marx told us, mind-forged manacles. Internal oppression, right, as we say today in modern social justice talk. Knowledge, however incomplete and fleeting, is to be found in the dialectical opposition of critical theory to this oppression. That's quite a lot, right? Um, Horkheimer and Habermas offer a more modest account of it. Now, I've stressed my view of this. My view is I'm still not convinced that they fully move beyond their own criticism of a subject who is a part of a greater system imposing external categories onto it. So, look... You know, the positivist is imagined to be imposing these categories like natural laws and science and whatever to the totality, but they're just imposing the category of the totality onto it. Now, maybe you can say the idea of the totality corresponds better with reality than the sort of laws that the positivists are saying. Um, That could be true, right? But the, the claim's thicker than that or it's more fundamental than that. The claim is that in some way the critical theorist is not merely imposing categories onto reality, but is engaging directly with reality itself. And I don't... There's something they think they've got that I'm not getting there, or they've sort of tricked themselves, and that's as far as I can go with that argument. Um... From what it's worth, here's here's my two cents. Um, Perhaps the truth of epistemology, at least in the social sciences, is that knowledge and understanding of reality consists in the imposition of flawed categories onto it. Critical theory makes some moves to show us that the problems that result from that, and that's fair, but I don't know that their theories have achieved anything but except the imposition of a different set of categories. So let's leave that there. What I, I said let's move on to methodology. 
how does methodology flow out of that? What methodology is even possible in that case? What does it mean? I, like, I'm not sure we can, but what does it mean to have a dialectic into in, engagement with reality itself? Well, the the account of positivism helps us out here, actually. Positivists are seen to be ex imposing external categories onto reality, and that guides the methodological criticisms of it. So, I think the most interesting of these is Horkheimer. He describes positivist methodology as employing a set of flawed objective categories in ever greater specificity. So when the categories positivists used to describe social reality fail to correspond to it, they divide them up into more and more subtypes, creating more and more jargon. Critical theory, in contrast, should be concerned with looking at the overarching structure of concepts from which that methodology is derived. When, when our categories and concepts don't match up to the world, we should, instead of going down the chain and making them more specific, we should go up the chain to consider the foundational premises from which they are derived. Um, Adorno, here we go. You ready? For, you, you know what's coming, right? Adorno says something similar, but you know, more radical and more complex. Adorno takes up a similar line of criticism, arguing that scientism will never be able to understand critical theory because it will always be attempting to apply these rigid, misconceived categories onto it. So, we can actually imagine a number of instances of this in the social sciences. Um, economic theory, for instance, creates theories and then makes them more technical and more complex in order to fully cohere with reality. So perhaps, Horkheimer might suggest, a more fruitful approach would be to consider some of the foundational concepts from which these theories are derived, such as, say, rationality or individuality. Now, What's, what I like about Horkheimer's work is it grounds a somewhat optimistic conception. So in Horkheimer's work, the social scientist can go back and reconsider and reconfigure these mistaken and in their eyes oppressive categories. Whereas Adorno is seemingly pessimistic that we can do that, and Habermas is often ambiguous. Ambiguous. Whereas I do like that Horkheimer contains a faith that the oppressive understandings of the world can be reconsidered. Now, I think what's wrong with all of that, and what's wrong with Marxism, even in its more nuanced and enlightened forms, is it sees getting away from these sort of, let's just take it as writ that the fundamental categories of economics are both misconceived and oppressive. The idea of rationality, individuality, you know, a, a particular conception of freedom, of utility, and so on. You may or may not agree, but let's just take that as a premise. What Marxism sees itself doing is of getting away from that false consciousness, as a Marxist would call it, to objective reality, that it's sort of a waking up in the world, a seeing things for the first time as they really are, an escape from Plato's cave, right? This fundamental vision of awakening to the truth in the world that's, that's animated Western thought since Plato. Critical theory is more nuanced and more pessimistic. It's saying, you know, we have these oppressive categories and we have to, con we, we can't ever fully explicate ourselves from them, but we have to have a dialectical engagement with them in which we abandon certain aspects of them, retain others, and perhaps more generally you might say transcend them, right? But in, in none of these cases is there a view of, of what I think is actually happening, which is just there are different sets of fundamental categories right? There's different fundamental 
methodological and epistemological and ontological sets of claims about the world. And there's just different clusters of essentially contestable concepts with which we use to describe the world, interpret it, and process our place within it. And I think the fundamental insight that's lacking in all of this thought, and this this really needed a mature reading of the letter Wittgenstein to get you to, is that's just the water in which the fish are swimming, and we're the fish. That there's no getting out of that. There's no switching it off to get to objective reality, or even dialectically transcending yourself from it, as the critical theorist would have it. You just have these different clusters of underlying values, which compete with each other. They compete with each other in academia, they compete with each other for control of actual political elites, and they compete with each other for what, like the proverbial man or woman on the street, will view as intuitive. Do people view themselves as intuitive? individuals or part of the social whole, or some balance. And if a balance, what? But there's no getting away from it. There's no point where we don't have a fundamental set of concepts. We just have different ones, and we can try and make a rational assessment as to which is better and which is worse. We can try and say some are clearly inadequate or impermissible, but that's just it. We're never going to get to the point where we don't have one, nor should we try, nor is it a s- particularly desirable that we do. So that's that's my personal reaction to this. But what are we to have made of this debate in general? I've done my best to walk you through it. God help me, I really have. Um, and if you thought the last hour was just incomprehensible jargon, um, it was at least less so than the actual debate from which I derived it from. What are we to make of this? Well, I think there's two lessons here, and I think they actually do apply to some of the modern debates that we have between sections on the left. Even though, and I want to be very clear, critical theory is not a historical precursor to social justice and intersectionality. That's the, the, the people who make that link are doing so as part of a bizarre anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. And if you want to see why, why would it be important for them to maintain that, it's because critical theorists were often Jews. And the idea is that Jews are kind of stirring the pot and they're pushing all of these ideas like multiculturalism and pluralism and tolerance to break down the fabric of Western society and so on. Not saying it's true, it's absolutely not, but that's not what I'm saying. But I actually think there's a couple of takeaways for how we talk to each other that might be useful for modern social justice and intersectionality claims. So the first is this. There's something clearly wrong with just the basic approach to how the critical theorists are going about this debate. They insist on using this highfalutin jargon and won't translate it into regular English, owing to, leading to, sorry, their opponents saying, well, here's what I think is their translation, and it sounds pretty trivial to me. Likewise, I think a lot of the sections of the left, not just the social justice left, the sort of Marxist left, Trotsky left, all these different subcultures can do that. They can they can get so caught up in their own jargon that they can't argue outside of it. And there's nothing wrong with being ideologically bilingual. Ideologies aren't just truth claims. They're, they're glasses through which we... They're, they're, they're spectacles through which we can view the world, and they're languages through which we can communicate the world. There's nothing wrong with saying, how would I communicate this set of claims? in another language? How would I translate it from critical theory to a sort of centrist incrementalism? But I think that speaks to a more fundamental problem with what critical theory is doing here, in that I think at the heart of this, like I say, critical theorists really feel like they're onto something 
which turns all of our some some weird abstract thing about like the subjective and the object from which everything else derives and will kind of turn all other forms of knowledge about society on its head and sort of what they're saying at the end of the day is i can't talk to you until you fully buy into and you 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 come to jesus right and have a moment where you get down on your knees and accept critical theory as your lord and savior and you go yes i get it now it's the totality and the dialectic and all of this right and that just isn't happening right like i think critical theorists are just going to be like i'm going to keep on misunderstanding you until you buy into the most foundational aspects of my worldview well that's just not how human beings are actually persuaded yes you do have these come to jesus moments but more commonly it's a sort of step-by-step -step process right like again if you're arguing social justice in the modern sense what's more important to you do we have to get people to buy into this idea of oppressed classes and like do they have to like suddenly start using words like whiteness or intersectionality or is it enough that we can say here's a specific instance where we can demonstrate through premises and methods of argument that are sort of acceptable to you that there is some sort of explicit or implicit discrimination and that we can create arguments again that rely on you know ways of communicating that are accessible to you that that discrimination is a moral problem and should be remedied we're not going to get a critical mass of people to fall down on their knees and have come to jesus moments because like i said it's all just these different clusters of fundamental categories right that's not going away we can bring some people over to our fundamental set of categories and we should try to and if people on the intersectional left you know want to try and bring more people into understanding everything exactly as they do they should do that but that shouldn't be to say that we can never meet people where they're at and we can never make arguments in terms that they can understand and that might be persuasive to them without having to buy into that fundamental set of categories and i don't mean to pick on the intersectional left though i think that's true of a lot of different groups on the left when talking specifically to other parts of the left the far left to the middle of the left the middle of the left to center and all the way back again and all of the sort of pluralism of stuff you have going on in different areas across that so supporters of different people's presidential campaigns tend to evolve different languages and so on and so often you sort of hear people essentially just saying you're talking past me and someone else saying but you're really not getting it where what they're not getting isn't a specific claim it's like a total worldview so that's my first thing don't assume that you, you, you people have to buy into everything you're saying and all of the language you're using and the total categories and concepts from which you're deriving it otherwise they're a complete enemy over which not only no common ground but no communication is possible that's what i think the critical theorists are doing here and i see that all across the left i see it on the like hardcore socialist left the marxist left the social justice left i see it most clearly actually <laughs> in the sort of um the centrist left who have their own language and discourse and set of concepts that they just really want to tell everyone else you have to talk through this language accept that we're in a multilingual space here an ideologically multilingual space you that's not going away and and when i hear people sounding like this i just you you're like these people who insist everyone speak english they're not going to and it's kind of obnoxious to make them try right be more versatile in their communication the other thing i want to say goes to the other side of that in which if you have someone who is straw manning you what's actually happening here and i think this is an interesting question to ask when you're being straw manned is it that they are just maliciously and willfully trying to discredit you which i don't think is what 
the critical theorists were trying to do to Popper. I don't think they were, like, out to get him for nasty reasons. I just think they couldn't see outside of the fact that they really were convinced of their fundamental paradigm and just couldn't get beyond the fact that he wouldn't buy into it, right? So what, what does that tell us now? Well, when you're on the left and you're talking to someone else on the left, and maybe even on the right or whatever, although I don't care as much about them, who's talking to you in a way where again and again they're just attacking beliefs that you don't really hold and applying labels to you that don't really seem to match, does that mean... That could mean one of two things. They're maliciously out to get you, which it could be, or that there's some sort of fundamental truth on the other side, or pur purported truth on the other side, which they're just increasingly frustrated that you're not getting. So the other moral is I would quite like it if Popper didn't just go, well, these guys aren't engaging honestly with me, therefore I'm done, you know, clap hands. If he said, okay, what is there to be learned and gained from this worldview? Can I move beyond the fact that I feel I'm not being accurately described? You know, does the fact that I'm not being accurately described mean that there are no accurate descriptions in this total worldview? And what I'd like to see the left do, this goes for the centre-left, it goes for the far-left, it goes for the radicals, it goes for the social justice types, it goes for the socialist types, is when they get to the point where they feel they're not being accurately described, to take a deep breath and do what I've tried to do and say, well, why is that? Is it because these people are just a bunch of bastards? Or is it because they really feel they've worked something out that I'm not getting? And more often, I think it is the latter. I do think coming from the other side of the aisle, and I won't say the political right, I'll say people who are invested in defending established power, when it comes to that, there are, when it comes to like Trump or something, there are just some bad actors there, and I'm not saying otherwise. But when it comes to interleft communication, I actually sort of think it's the opposite. And I, I don't think there's sort of like one animating principle to the left. I think there's a number of different animating principles that sort of can sometimes pull together and sometimes pull apart and sometimes just frankly speak straight past each other. So that's sort of like my moral of the story, is I think there is a takeaway into thinking about, you know, what can we learn from just one of the silliest and funniest and most acrimonious exchanges that we see in the sort of history of the social sciences? Well, it's not necessarily about how to have a conversation to convince people. That's not what I'm saying here. You're not going to get to the point of unity, you positivist, you. I joke. But, like, you're not going to... If your goal in political discourse is how do I get everyone to agree with me, I think you're going to fail. And I think you're going to approach things a bit like the positivists did here. And I think many sections of the left do today. I think it's more an awareness about, like, what is actually going on. And here's what I think is going on, is there's multiple distinct clusters of foundational concepts that we can see on the left, and as they express themselves in political discourse, they become a kind of language, right? I think that there is a moral of the story that we shouldn't not talk to people because they won't just learn our language. But then on the other side, when people are sort of talking to us in a different language, I don't know we should just shut that down completely. Can we learn a few words and phrases of their language? Might it be useful for us to do so? And what you're not going to get from that is unity. That's not coming, and it probably isn't desirable. But what you might get is a deeper and richer understanding of the varied and the often quite beautiful terrain that surrounds you in terms of the plurality of fundamental worldviews that are out there. Mm -hmm.